All right, get ready, because we're going way back for this deep dive. Did you know that in ancient Rome, like way back when, the army actually used tabletop gaming to, get this, map out their battle strategies? Oh, really? Yeah, I'm talking centuries ago. It's like they were running early simulations without even knowing it, you know, testing out tactics, seeing what worked. Talk about getting a leg up on the competition. It's wild how that impulse to learn and strategize through games it's like hardwired into us even thousands of years ago. Totally. It makes you wonder what those Roman generals would make of today's simulations, right? The crazy realism, the tech. I can only imagine. But hold your horses. We're getting ahead of ourselves. First things first, got to break down what gaming simulation actually is and what it isn't. And lucky for us, we've got this piece by George Otoyu to guide us. He's a UI, UX designer. Seems like he's really into this stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's this article on Medium, Unpacking the Journey, insights into the nature of gaming simulation and it goes deep you know like one thing he points out is how people mix up gaming simulation with gamification all the time yeah happens all the time defining gaming simulation it's almost like trying to nail down like what's a cloud you know it's always changing right so maybe a good place to start is what's gamification then if it's not this okay so think of it this way gamification is taking those things we love about games points badges leaderboards all that good stuff and like sprinkling it onto something that isn't a game to make it more fun, more engaging. Okay, I think I'm getting it so it's like my fitness tracker that gives me like virtual high fives when I hit my step goal. Exactly. Or that app that tries to make doing your taxes less painful by turning it into some kind of weird game. Making the mundane more palatable. I like it. Exactly. Now, gaming simulation, that's different. It's less about making something fun and more about creating a system that really mirrors real life stuff, like mm -hmm. processes, scenarios, you name it. So it's about getting as close to the real deal as possible, but like without the actual risk. You got it. Risk-free, safe space to, you know, experiment, learn. That's the beauty of it. Okay, I'm with you. So we've got simulating reality versus gamifying an activity, but there's another term that Otoyu throws around, serious games. Where does that fit into all of this? Serious games can definitely overlap with gaming simulation, for sure. Mm. But the main difference, think of it like this. With a serious game, the point isn't just to have fun, it's to learn something real, you know, mm. even if it's still engaging, still a game. Ah, okay, so like that flight simulator our pilot friend uses to practice, that'd be a serious game because it's not just about racking up points, it's about learning a real world skill. Nailed it. What? Though it's worth pointing out that flight simulator it uses simulation to create that super realistic experience. Right, right, of course. So simulation, gamification, serious games. S starting to see why Otoyu calls it a word salad, huh? Yeah, tell me about it. But the way this article unpacks it is really cool. He takes us back in time, actually, back to the roots of gaming simulation. You mean like all the way back to those Roman war games we were talking about? You know it. <laughs> but he also dives into this ancient Japanese game, W-E-I-H-A-I, -I, which is like, the OG of Go, if you can believe it. W-E-I-H-A-I. -I. Okay, oh, I gotta look that one up. Both of them, though, they're all about strategic thinking, planning, outsmarting your opponent. It's fascinating how these skills, they're just as important in a boardroom today as they were on a battlefield centuries ago. It's true. You know, it's like that saying, the more things change. If the more they stay the same. Right. Exactly. And this wasn't just happening in Rome and Japan either. Yeah. Turns out, throughout history, all kinds of cultures were using games to sharpen their minds, get ready for real-life challenges. So this whole idea of simulating situations, even if it's with, like, wooden pieces on a board, it's not just a modern thing. It's, like, ingrained in us. 100%. But obviously technology. That's been a total game-changer in how we simulate things. Like... Fast forward from ancient Rome to, say, the 1980s, you've got things like SimNet and ModSaf, these super high-tech military simulations they were using to train soldiers. Oh, 1980s, that's still pretty early for computers, right? It was cutting edge at the time. And these weren't just basic games either. They were designed to be so real, so immersive, that people actually thought they were interacting with real people, not just some computer program. Whoa, that's crazy. It's like they were basically living in the Matrix, but for training. Right. And that brings up a really key point. The more technology advances, the more realistic and immersive these gaming simulations can get. But there's another layer to this, and it's one that Otoyu dives into in the article. 
this idea of gainful design. Gainful design. Okay, you're going to have to break that one down for me. So gainful design, it's like the secret sauce, you yeah. know. It's taking all those things that make games so engaging, so motivating, even addictive sometimes, and using them in other areas of life. So it's less about, like, fancy graphics and more about understanding the psychology behind why we love games so much. Bingo. It's about tapping into that gamer mindset, that feeling of, I can do this, mm. the optimism, the curiosity, and using that to tackle real world problems. So instead of just playing a game to escape reality, we can bring a little bit of that magic into our everyday lives. I love it. Exactly. And it all ties into this really cool area of psychology called the PERMA model. Ever heard of it? Can't say that I have. Okay, so PERMA. It stands for Positive Emotions, Engagement, Relationships, Meaning, and Accomplishment. These are like the five pillars of well-being. Five pillars. Okay, I'm following. And the idea is if you can cultivate these things in your life, you're going to be happier, more fulfilled. It's all about feeling good and living a meaningful life. Okay, makes sense. So how does gameful design connect to all of that? Well, think about what happens when you're really into a good game, right? You're completely absorbed, feeling all those positive emotions as you overcome challenges. You hit those milestones, those little victories. Oh, yeah, totally. It's like super engaging, even addictive sometimes. Exactly. You're completely immersed, maybe even collaborating with other people if it's a multiplayer game, and you feel that sense of accomplishment when you succeed. Like you've actually achieved something meaningful, even though it's just a game. Right. And that's what's so powerful about it. Yeah. It's tapping into something fundamental about what makes us human. That's so interesting, that connection between how a game is designed and these basic human needs we all have. It's like there's a lot more to gaming than meets the eye. Way more. And this is where it gets really interesting because, like Otoyu says, there's a real art to using these principles well. It's not just about slapping a progress bar on something and calling it gamification. It takes a deep understanding of psychology, motivation, what makes us tick. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. Room and war games, flight simulators, even my fitness tracker. But I think the question on everyone's mind is like, how does this actually apply to our lives? You know, we're not all designing the next big game or anything. But that's the cool thing, though. You don't have to be a game designer to, like get something out of this. Mm -hmm. Just knowing about this stuff, how gaming simulation works, gameful design can be really powerful. You okay, know? yeah, sell me on it. Well, for one, think about all those companies out there, right? Using gamification to like nudge us in certain directions. Sometimes we don't even realize it's happening. Oh, 100%, like all those apps with the endless notifications. Exactly, or those loyalty programs, you yeah. know, always dangling that next reward. Yeah. It's all designed to keep us hooked, even if it's not always good for us. Yeah, my screen time report would agree with you on that one. Right. But here's the thing. Once you understand the psychology, like why it works, those little dopamine hits, you can start to see the pattern, you mm -hmm. know? And then you can make better choices, take back control. It's like having a cheat code for the digital world. I like it. There you go. But it's bigger than just like resisting your phone too. This stuff, gameful design, it's got huge potential in other areas, like education, for example. Oh, yeah, for sure. I've seen some really cool educational games, especially for kids. It makes learning actually fun. Right. It's all about tapping into that natural drive to play, that curiosity. But it doesn't have to stop with kids either. Imagine applying those same principles to things like employee training, you know, mm -hmm. professional development. We could even use it to tackle big, complicated problems. Okay, now you've got my attention. Give me an example. All right, let's take climate change. Right. Huge issue. Feels overwhelming to even think about sometimes, right? Totally. But what if there was a simulation, a really good one, that let people experiment with different solutions, see what happens, but in a safe environment, no real-world consequences? It's like that saying, um, tell me and I forget, show me and I remember. Involve me and I understand. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's what gaming simulation can do, you know? It takes learning beyond just reading about something. It makes it real. Totally. So we've got resisting manipulation. We've got changing how we learn. But Otoyu also talks about using gaming to like understand ourselves better, which I yeah. thought was fascinating. Oh, absolutely. That's one of the most powerful things about games, I think. Yeah. It can teach us about what makes us tick. Like, What kind of games do you find yourself drawn to? Mm, interesting. What gets you excited to play? What totally frustrates you? These things tell us something, you know? It's like my gaming preferences are basically a personality test. I never thought of it that way. In a way, yeah. Think about it. Do you like competition? 
or do you prefer to collaborate with others? Do you like solving puzzles, or is it more about exploring a big open world? These aren't just random things. They show us how our brain works, how we approach challenges. So you're saying all those late night gaming sessions, those weren't a waste of time. It was self-discovery. See, there you go. And the more we pay attention to these patterns, the more we can use that knowledge in other parts of our lives. Choose a career path, set goals that really mean something to us, even build stronger relationships because we get why we do the things we do. That's really cool when you think about it that way. It's like games are a reflection of ourselves if we know how to look. But I'd imagine there are some challenges, right, to using all this potential. It's not always easy to connect the dots. Right. And Otoe is right. This whole field, it's still evolving. There's so much we're still figuring out. Like one of the biggest hurdles, as we've kind of touched on, is just having a common language. You know, the word salad problem. Exactly. Until we can all agree on what these terms mean, gamification, serious games, all of it. It's tough to have a productive conversation, you know, yeah. to really move things forward. So we need to agree on the recipe before we can start cooking. Exactly. Plus, technology never sits still, mm -hmm. right? What we can create now compared to even a few years ago, it's mind blowing. So the possibilities for gaming simulation are just going to keep growing. Which makes you wonder, what incredible stuff are we going to be able to do in the future, right? And speaking of the future, Otoy ends his article on a really thought-provoking note. He brings us back to those ancient civilizations we talked about earlier. Great circle. It's like he's saying, those ancient Romans with their little game pieces, they were onto something big. And if they could do that back then with what they had... Imagine what we could accomplish now, right? With the tech we have, the knowledge... It kind of blows your mind. It really does. Like, what if we could use gaming simulation to tackle climate change for real or poverty or even like cure diseases? Yeah. All while playing a game, basically. It sounds crazy, but honestly, <laughs> I think we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. And it's not just about the tech itself either. It's about understanding ourselves, how we learn best, and then using that knowledge to design experiences that can like actually change things. Exactly. So to everyone listening out there, next time you boot up your favorite game, you know, whatever it is that gets you hooked, take a second. Think about what's going on behind the scenes, the design, the way it makes you feel. Because hidden in there, there's actually some clues about how our brains work, how we connect, what motivates us. Who knows? Maybe you'll even be inspired to use a little bit of that game magic in your own life, you know, to try something new, tackle a problem in a different way. This has been The Deep Dive. Thanks for listening.